they did. Were, if they would have just held, if, the, if they just would have held strong, um, yeah, they probably would have gotten off. Um, they very likely would have gotten off. But now they're federal. You know, they're felons in possession with firearms now if they had them. So um, that's that's such a and um, <clears throat> that's such a like if even if you're especially if you're like a two A patriot, not being able to legally own firearms is like cutting off your dick. Um, essentially, so like that's yeah, that's, and, and, and that's a bad deal. Thing number one, thing number two, the dicks getting cut off during Malaher. A lot of weird shit happened. And one oh of the weird God, things, bless you it. and I actually broke the story. Oh, I forgot it. about that. Oh my God, I'm totally remembering. Hey, you brought about a dick getting cut off, and I'm gonna fucking bring it up because uh-huh. this was a fucking weird shit when it happened. And your reaction oh. is perfect for everybody who haven't had this yet a chance yet to listen to the older podcast. But the, the thing autograph about the bag dildos. Is, God damn it. And there was that too. There was a lot of weird dick related shit related to Malaher, by the way, folks. So just just FYI. If you haven't even gone back and listened to the archive, I was just you would, but we'll keep it short here. Yes, remember Ritzheimer with the whole he was opening the bag of dicks thing because somebody sent in a bag uh one of the some of the people who were disagreeing with the protesters basically sent in the bag of dicks so they could eat it. And then yes, there was there was the other thing that you were mentioning. If you want to enlighten the listeners about that one too, all I, all I remember it was uh, it was like an Oregon militia, I think it was, um, and they yes, like they auto they autographed them and are like going to raise money, like like autograph. Yep, builders. they were. Uh, yep, they were going to do that too. That yeah, so there was so yes, yeah, there's there's there were separate penis related accoutrement things that were related to Malaher. And this is something the corporate media never brought up because I guess they didn't think it was funny enough or interesting enough or just pl- or as I think of it, it's, it's just plain p- weird. It's bizarre. I don't think it's it's it's. I don't know why. I, yeah, right. It's bizarre. Right. What what do dildos and candy dicks have anything to do with federal land use policy? And yeah, that probably should go in a bumper sticker somewhere. But you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Christ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Christ is right. Exactly. I mean, this is the kind of insanity of the first realm. This is why we're trying to get away from all that, build a second realm, you know, the Agora and all that. Because by the time, this is fucking clown world. What's going on, everybody? Uh, so we went and picked up some mail that came in from, you know, a lot of the uh, supporters. But along with that mail, we got a, a an abundance of the hate mail. And it just, it, it was really mind-blowing to me that people would actually spend their money you know this box right here seventeen dollars and ninety cents they spend and waste their money on all this hateful stuff to send out here to us and, and buy this ridiculous stuff i got it's it's really ridiculous even uh this one was really funny a bag of dicks um so rather than going out and doing good you know um they just spend all their money on hate and hate and hate and hate so we're gonna create a table and we're going to continue to do work and do good for our country. Uh, we're not going to be deterred. We're not going to let you, all your junk and hate mail sidetrack us. And we're going to continue to do what's right for our country. All right, welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you vulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Ray O2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about this early yet already operating parallel network, uh, please visit Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A, dot com. Uh, today I'm pleased to welcome back uh, f- my friend and co-host uh, Kyle Reardon. Uh, now, we don't have a big overarching episode planned for you today. Um, I mean, we've got plenty of those in the works for sure. Um, but we do have, I guess, for, for today, we've just got a few discussion items and uh, a uh, catch-up chat is always a value. Uh, so anyway, I figure we'll start with uh, life and homestead updates uh, from Kyle and I, respectively. Um, next, I'll give Kyle and uh, you an update on the Vanuzine digitization project, uh, coming publications, uh, episodes, and progress. And uh, finally, I think it's time uh, we take a segment to provide updates on the political prisoners uh, covered in the LEO Publications archive. Um, yeah, basically, you know what's what's happened in you know the five or however many years it's been since they've been locked up. Um, and uh, then I guess uh, I'll probably also fill in Kyle on the recent developments in the crypto war because I know he's been busy, uh, which I'm sure he'll fill us in on momentarily. But uh, he's been busy on his end, so I'm not sure he's kept up with 
uh, you know, things happening in the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin privacy space, uh, coming with, uh, you know, Department of Justice and such. Not not necessarily fun situations, but we'll get to those later on. Um, and then obviously, if Kyle has, uh, Kyle, if you have anything on your mind, which I think you do, uh, the floor will be open, uh, I guess, whenever you want to, to, to mention those things. But uh, that out of the way, welcome back, man. Uh, how are things going? Uh, things have been better. Things have been worse. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, to quote a certain book, right? Um, long and short of it, uh, the, the, the main meat of it is that there's been some things of a war nature, of a financial nature, and even of a, I guess you could even say religious nature that's been kind of on my mind. We'll, we'll, we'll get to those today, but yeah, uh, let's just say my, my personal life has been kind of starting to settle down in some ways, and, and we'll get to at least some of that today, because I think the issue of free mates and the vulnerability to coercion that they either help you with or hurt you with is, is always a relevant issue. That is something we're always continuously exploring. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And hey, Kyle, um, I'm going to just give me one second. I'm going to disconnect from my VPN. I forgot to turn off my two-op two op VPN. Um, so that might be why it Ooh. sounds. Um, so give me just like 10 seconds and it'll reconnect. Fine. Okay. But, uh, but yeah. Um, so anyway, we're. I think it's back. The yeah, the connection is already better. So yeah, if you have a if you have a two out VPN on, um, it will make them make it sound very boomy. Um, it won't sound as clear. Lesson learned. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, so so uh, um, I guess uh, any uh, you kind of I guess alluded to some things, and maybe maybe we'll just start with these because I guess these are your life updates. But um, yeah, I guess uh, what's what's been going on? Um, I guess the past month or so. Uh, uh, yeah, what's been going on the past month or so, and uh, I guess any any updates you you would like to give uh, the listeners on, I guess uh, exporting labor or anything of that nature. Sure. So a couple things. I'll try to keep it brief because there's some other stuff in the works that I'm not yet ready to talk publicly about yet. But here's what I can talk about. So I was served with divorce papers by a process server back on April 30th. Uh, I was literally coming back from being on post, so I'm still all in uniform and all that. And he's blocking the driveway. I see some dude walking around the house. And there's like two possibilities I'm thinking of. Either this guy is in the middle of an attempted burglary or it's some sort of legitimate purpose and I still need to talk to him. Turns out it was just uh, I got served for a divorce. So the chances for reconciliation are now not possible. The only real development along that end is I did text my soon-to-be ex-wife and basically she said that, uh, quote, I, uh, when I when I asked her, did you want to divorce me back on New Year's Eve when you said you wanted a separation? Uh, she, her reply exactly was, uh, quote, no, I did what I thought was best. Close quote. So make of that what you will. Um, I, I At this point, it's like I know as much as you know, and I'm the one in the middle of it, right? So the point is, she wanted the separation, she wanted the divorce, she's pushing all this real quickly. And so at this point, honestly, Shane, we're just doing paperwork. And here's the other problem, too. She drew the state in, um, at least in terms of making the divorce happen. So it is true that we did get married. We did it that other way where, um, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but we don't have a marriage license. We only use this, it was that, it was that other way of getting married in, in Texas where, uh, the state is only being used as a third party to basically uh, say, like, okay, we are basically bearing witness to the fact that, you know, these two people are getting married, right, or have chosen to be married. That's all we did. Um, so now she's dragging the state back in to effectuate a divorce, which, by the way, as of right now, it's not even contested. So literally what we're just doing is doing paperwork and just finalizing stuff just so we can put on other documents in the future, marital status divorce. That's it. Um, she moved out first week of January and so forth. So at this point, there's not really any communication being done. She's not interested in any sort of reconciliation, which I already knew was a slim chance. And it's just doing paperwork. So, uh, yeah, so in terms of the Freemates, I think anybody who does like a, like a certain hand fastening or anything else along those lines is probably the right way to go. Um, because even when I try to do a variation on, uh, or which actually is even a state recognized marriage, I still got screwed in, in a manner of speaking, even if it's only lightly, uh, or not so deep, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So there's that, um, had a recent job change recently. So I'm no longer doing the school security again, speak for, speak about some statism, right? Um, I just got horribly, horribly sick again. 
Um, I got uh, part of what I got was subconjunctival hemorrhaging, which basically means bleeding in the eyeball. Uh, I went to a paramedic friend of mine because I was asking, do I need to go back to the ER again like I did back in January, which was a separate, which I actually got a diagnosis for. It's influenza B and a hospital bill I can't pay back in the tune of thousands of dollars, which I'm not going to ask anybody for money on because I'm just not going to pay it. Um, I think it's, I think it's going to be the very first bill in my life I'm deliberately going to welch on because it's just, I looked at the itemized bill list and it just looked like bullshit. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. Not for the level of service they gave me. Sorry. Um, Thousand so, dollars hey, for like, a, for like a saline IV or something. Yeah, I've seen some of those ridiculous yeah, things pretty that much. They, they put on there. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was, yeah, it was saline IV. I know they put me up in some sort of machine, like an MRI type thing. It was some other CAT scan or whatever the hell it was, and that was about it. And it's just like you know what, this is not worth in excess of four thousand dollars that I don't have because I'm also trying to pay off some other debts and get some savings and try to get my life going again. You know, post divorce. So I'm just not going to do this. Uh, very first time in my life I'm going to welch on it, uh, but because some other friends I've talked to have said that they welch on their hospital bills, it's good because of how the American medical system is. It's kind of like, eh, do I really feel bad? It's like, well, what was the level of service I got again? Is it really worth that much? Really? Really? Do I really feel that way? No. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I, the point is I work in the school security. Uh, the different sites, both the temporary ones and, my, and the permanent one, which ironically I lasted less long at than my temporary ones, which is ironic. So I guess the definitions of temporary and permanent have now changed, or shall we say switch places where the temporary is permanent and the permanent is temporary. Mm, gotta love that double speak. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I just kept getting sick over and over and over again. And the when I got the hemorrhaging in the eyeball, apparently, uh, according to that paramedic friend of mine and some other people, because I was asking for opinions and all that, um, yeah, I was basically sneezing and coughing so violently hard that I literally blew a capillary in my eyeball, hence why there is actual blood. So it's not an irritation, it's not the look of somebody who's like been smoking cannabis. It was literally blood in my eyeball. And thankfully, everything turned out okay because apparently this kind of thing has happened before with other people. And basically what it is that basically you just wait up to about approximately two weeks for the blood to be reabsorbed back in the body, and then your eye clears up. And that's pretty much it. And I'm just like, wow. That was a bit of a learning curve where the main danger wasn't so much a hypothetical so-called active shooter or the much more likely kidnappers because disgruntled parents will do disgruntled parent things. And a lot of times there's custody disputes because a lot of those people are divorced too, or in various stages of separation and so forth. The job change now is I'm actually currently in training to do work armored car. Finally, finally, this has been like more than, I, I almost gave up on it. And it was kind of funny how it happened, Shane. So it was an application with a certain company that shall go unnamed from last November, I put an application. They did get back to me at the time and said, oh yeah, thanks for applying, but your application's on hold because we have no new positions available. And then I did get back to them at the time and said, if you have no new positions available, how was I able to apply for a position that had the appearance of being open, but then when I apply for it, you now tell me that it's not available. So yeah. there's that little Orwellian little thing there. So ironic, so then you, past a little bit of time. Now we're like in uh, approximately, what was it, February, March this year. And uh, they, ac they actually reached out to me and said, oh, by the way, the position that you applied for that was on hold from, from last year, it's now open. Are you still interested in if so? When can we schedule a job interview? And of course I said yes, because the company owners that were uh, for the company I was doing the school security for were freaking god awful, which is really a story for another time as to why that was. But basically I said, yes, of course, so I'm doing job interviews. Next thing you know, bada boom, bada bing. I actually snagged this job, uh, which is a freaking miracle because the last armored car company I tried to go with was, it was a freaking disaster. I never even made it to day one. These guys, however, not only did I make it to day one, I'm going through the training period right now. And the training is fun too. They're saying, under these circumstances, throw the bag down and run away. And under these circumstances, it's two to the chest and one to the head. Literally, that's what we were taught. So they're telling us under what conditions we need to run away and under what conditions we need to, you know, put a motherfucker down, basically, hmm. literally, with lead. And I'm like, wow, 
this is definitely a different way of doing security. I think I like it. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of customer service shit going on too much other than dealing with the clients. It's basically, uh, you're basically acting like you're in a hostile environment. And, and that's not completely crazy because you're based, the one bad thing about a working armored car is that you're basically a rolling target. True, yeah. Right. The not to go too long about this, but basically you're wearing a uniform. You have <clears throat> for that you have to be, even I would say that. You have to be uniformed. You have to you have to be open carrying because that's part of being uniformed. And then your actual vehicle, the armored truck, has to be a mark a properly marked vehicle. It has to be. It's also a specialized vehicle because by definition it's armored. So yeah, you are a rolling target. It is very much uh, you are doing officer presence even before you're there kind of thing. And then after that, I'll say one more thing. Part of the training, too, is there's a certain specific way we're supposed to carry the bag of the client's property. And with our, our weapon, hand, we're supposed to have our hand on our firearm as we are walking on the client's property, like we're about to draw and fucking kill somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, we're not, this is part of the training. We are not supposed to be playing games. This is a very serious, very dangerous type of job. And I'm like, Wow, I like this. When do I start? Because kind of, <laughs> we're actually, it's funny, actually, uh, the next two days we're actually supposed to do, because uh, so far we've been doing mostly classroom training, and we did go out to the range, and I got requalified again for the next year for my security licenses, which was good. Um, right. There's still some paperwork to be done on that. But basically we went to the range, and part of that range time, too, sorry, one more thing, part of that range time, too, was uh, the instructor said, okay, now we've done the state qualifying stuff, and also the company required stuff separately for that. He actually asked, do you boys want some advanced training? And, of course, we all said yes. So he said, okay, I'm going to teach you two things. One, we're going to do some point shooting. And the second thing is we're all mostly going to teach you how to shoot from the hip. And I remember one of the other new hires, he's like, I, that's not the movie. That's not real, is it? The instructor said, I'm going to teach you the parts of it that are real. And, yes, we, I, I guess, as of uh, last Thursday, I got formal training on how to do hip shooting. Hint, hint lean back a little bit, tilt the pistol up a little bit, because unfortunately if you try to do try to shoot the way you think it is, uh, the shots will go down range more than, it'll hit low, basically. So tilt your back up, aim the pistol a little bit higher than you think, and it'll pretty much shoot straight pretty much for the most part. So I think a little bit of a wild time this past week, and in a good way. Um, the only other thing I'll say very briefly is that um, in terms of the house and unpacking for the move, I've gotten a few more rooms done with the with the help of a good friend of mine. So uh, and there's still some there's still some rooms to go. Uh, not to borrow the name of that one particular company, right? But um, it's it's a lot of shit's been thrown out. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is um, I I've already been putting a pile together for my ex of stuff to like return to her because when I was selfishing the stuff from our apartment, our, what was our home for three years, uh, she abandoned so much stuff. And some of the stuff that I salvage is stuff that's just her thing. Not a, not, not a me thing, not an us thing, but strictly her stuff. So she left a lot of strictly her stuff behind that she just abandoned that first week in January. So um, when I'm ready, I'll definitely be returning that to her because I've been finding more and more of her stuff as I've been, as me and my friend have been digging through the stuff that I salvaged from the apartment. So that's pretty much what's been going on with me is basically divorce, unpacking, and new job. And that's pretty much it. So in terms of stuff that's been going on with like DOJ pulling, you know, whatever stunts or whatever that I'm sure you're going to get to, uh, I haven't really had time to get into many of that because my per- I'm trying to rebuild my personal life. And so right. far it's going good, but it's been, it, it's been an uphill thing like since if it's pushing the boulder up the hill. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Well, that's that's definitely good news on. Uh, <clears throat> that's uh, definitely outstanding news on on the job. Um, it sounds like it'll be a lot better than what you've been doing before, and um, yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm good to hear. It's good to hear you're getting settled in better, or settled in more. Um, John, I know, I, I know that that's uh, you know settle you know settling in and you know a place becoming home. Um, it's definitely a, definitely an important thing. So. Um, yeah, all good stuff. All good stuff. So I guess I'll just mention um, real quick. I guess for your benefit, uh, Kyle, and, and maybe for those who didn't see the, uh, I released a, like a six minute homestead update video yesterday. All right, yeah, it was uh, yesterday or a couple days ago. Hey guys, Shane. Oh, shoot, I gotta turn off. Let me get that audio. Um, but uh, yeah, been busy here at um, the homestead. Um, get the video going. Um, there we go. 
so anyway, as the as the viewers will see, uh, you know, on Fascist Tube or Odyssey or uh, now Rumble, um, we've been uh, busy. Uh, you know, all, all, all you know, all we all we pretty much do in the spring is put up fence. But this time, we don't want to do this shit again. Um, so we're doing we're putting together our forever forever fence with you know big like nine inch I think they're nine inch uh, corner posts like big nine inch corner posts wooden corner posts with cement um, and then cattle panels and expanding the uh, the old obviously the the old remnant area and uh, um, putting the fencing around uh, around to the you know the double doors at the big shed um, for the uh, you know the female lambs and goats to get them out uh, so we can sw- so we can feed them like grain specifically because otherwise they they compete <laughs> i guess the the bigger lambs compete with them and they don't get as much so um and we're going to start milking um that's going to be you know, going to be a huge thing especially we, we just got a couple new baby uh, uh baby female um baby female goats um this past spring so uh and, and uh, goat milk um so we buy our we buy a raw a2a2 A2 dairy uh cow, cow's milk um for nine dollars a gallon and it's like nine or ten dollars a quart for for goat milk um, so yeah, that's, I guess it's, I mean, that's one, just one, one thing I'll, I'll toss in there, but, uh, but yeah, we're, it's, it's, I mean, it's a huge fencing project. Um, absolutely massive. Um, it'll be like, I guess stage one, um, you know, now, and then, uh, stage two, um, you know, towards the end of the year, once we recoup some, some funds, cause it'll, it'll, uh, yeah, it'll take, uh, take a little bit more, but it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely great steps forward. Um, great steps forward. Um, trying to think if there's anything else, um, on the homestead, uh, not really. I guess the the ponds, the pond, the ponds uh, coming up in the video, and the ponds filling up very, very quickly, which is which is surprising. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Kyle. No, I was just thinking parallel universe. You know, had I had had my uh, wife not left me, I was actually thinking. You know, we would have been a lot closer doing what what you know you and her do in terms of. Uh, like you mentioned, a forever fence and and the pond filling up, and like, geez, I wish I was at where you're at. Really, I do. Uh, but unfortunately, things kind of went sideways for me, and now I'm kind of having to focus on other things. Unfortunately, but I wish I was homesteading. Honestly, um, you know, here in Texas, I mean, I mean, basically, uh, you know, there's a lot of cattle, um, and also, if I remember correctly, I think some people are starting to get into uh, cultivating cannabis uh, openly, white market. Mm-hmm. Um, so like there's, there, there's, there's opportunities of one flavor or another that could have been done, but unfortunately, like I said, things for me went sideways and I have to focus on some other things at least for a while. But the fact that you're able to, to get put up a fence and fill up a pond, like for me, that's like, you're light years ahead of me right now. Maybe not for forever, but definitely for right now you are. And I, I just, I have just the slightest twinge of envy, but I mean that as in, in a very positive way, my friend. No, I, I, I definitely get it. Man. I definitely get it. Um, no, it's 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 happened. I mean, um, obviously, it's it's taken. I guess um, it's taken a few years. I guess to put a lot of this stuff together. But I guess the first year and year or two was a lot of just trial and error um, on all fronts, and actually like learning how to do this shit. Um, so yeah, I guess when you, when you build six or seven fences and you realize that they they slowly get they slowly get less shittier, and then you've realized by the fourth or fifth time how to actually do it. So. Um, yeah, it's it's getting better, and I guess the the other thing I'll toss out there, um, and my land guy confirmed this. Um, he takes uh, um, he where I, I, he's where I got a, um, most of my lambs from. I guess all of them actually, but uh, he takes he has uh, herds of like two hundred, three hundred sheep, and um, he doesn't even process them. You take them to live auction, and you get. I mean, it depends on you know what they're going for, um, you know that day, um, but uh, he gets anywhere from to like two or two fifty a pound. Um, for lambs, and he, he says you make more off like you, he he makes more off of uh, sheep than um, some people can make off cows, even though cows are a lot bigger. Um, so yeah, like I, I guess he takes it. He takes you know four or five hundred a year and um, for auction. And I'm just like I, I'm, I'm just thinking like you know if you, you can get you know thirty, forty, fifty lambs a year to take to auction. Um, you know it's you know obviously all, all of the. Um, no, it's about it's it's not a large chunk of change, but the, I guess the 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 point of uh, you know the financial independence that we've talked about so often is, um, you know, having like a dozen income streams like that, and you know, like that's kind of the that's kind of the goal, I guess. Um, and then yeah, down the road we've got we've got a whole other field on the other side, um, which could double or triple our our um fen- like our fenced area space, or I guess our grazing pasture space. 
Um, so yeah, I could definitely, and then basically raise them for free on grass and then take them to sell at the end of the year. And then the only expense at that point is just water. So, um, which doesn't even have to be an expense. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of going, um, I've raised a lot of birds and I, my goal was to, you know, raise, you know, a hundred birds plus. Um, but I'm kind of, uh, backing off that now and, uh, switching over to, uh, over to lambs a little bit and basically just raising chickens for eggs. And you don't need that many. You don't need like 30 or 40 like we have now even. Um, you only need like a dozen. So um, it'll make it a lot easier to take care of them, a lot easier to feed. But anyway, I guess that's those are kind of the big the big home set updates, trying to um, yeah get things in place. Uh, there's kind of a vision, I suppose. But, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, no, no, seriously, that's a good, that's a good thing you got, especially just one side note that you've got enough grazing land and all that to get feed, getting feed for your uh, livestock and, cat, uh, and and whatever else, that those prices can get a little, uh, it's a little too high for comfort, you know, starting to approach gas prices in some ways. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. But so that, I guess that's another advantage is, um, so, um, we don't, none of our animals get corn or soy on the property and the lambs and goats, well, I guess the, I guess the birds do too. They get their own natural, uh, or I guess they, they get their own homemade feed now too. Um, but we get, we, uh, we get a lot of organic wheat, uh, grain sent to the distillery. Um, so for me to get, uh, to get it to like $30 a pound or, or whatever the, whatever the, I can't remember what, what, not $30 a pound, but, um, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the, uh, the comparison, but anyway, um, I, I can get uh, 50 pound bags for $20, um, organic for organic um, wheat, um, which generally, I guess that'd be like 40 or 50 bucks a bag, which is totally unsustainable. But I guess the good thing is at the distillery, we go, we have so many bags that a lot of rats like get into them and we can't use them. So I get, I basically get a lot of the, a lot of their feed. I guess the last like month of feed has been all just free. Um, so it's like free organic grains for, for the lambs, um, that we just, just can't use. So, um, it's, it's super, super advantageous. Um, optimal so i think it'd be silly not to do it and then again for the ones that we sell we wouldn't um they might actually get corn um because my neighbor um raised it it's not gmo corn um it's raised right over on my dad's property um you know right over there but um yeah anyway um they might get corn to fatten them up a little bit because most people don't care that much so (laughs) but uh yeah i guess that's that's pretty much uh pretty much it here um yeah i don't want to take up too much time with uh with homestead updates, I guess the yeah, I guess the the other thing is, uh, um, is it next weekend already? Shit, yeah, it is. Um, next weekend is our, our I guess our, our next Pasni event. Um, what's so it's Memorial Day weekend, the Freedom Holiday. Uh, it's Volunteerism Day, right? Does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds right. Okay, yeah. So it's our Volunteerism weekend uh, weekend gathering here at uh, at Veritas. Um, and yeah, I don't think it's going to be you know a big event like Bonnie Fest, but there's at least going to be a, a few folks coming out, um, and it'll be a, a fun a fun time. So if you uh, if if uh, anyone out there is listening uh, and uh, is vetted or wants to get vetted to come out to an event, um, especially this one, uh, reach out coordinator at pazania dot com or you know a, a private message uh, wherever you like. So um, as as Vonnie podcast listeners are are well aware by now, because it's been I guess most of the releases over the past few months. Um, but uh, I got I I. It was in a digitizing frenzy. Um, I'm not sure what came over me, but um, I uh, I finished all of Vonnie Life and Vonnie Link, um, which Vonnie Life turned into Vonnie Link essentially after um, after like 1973 edition, the March 1973 edition. Yeah, that's or right. Level four. That's right. Um, so I got all that done, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, absolutely fantastic, and just some some I guess some some interest, some just some fascinating historical tidbits that. Um, that uh, I guess you you wouldn't uh, you just wouldn't expect like seeing uh, well I'm not even gonna mention it right now but it's it'll be the, the forward will be, the forward is pretty spectacular um, and it and it was easy to write um, because again like all the Vani material is great but there's a couple things like from historical nature um, like a couple people that were contributors to preform inform Vani life etc innovator even in, in some cases um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. So I guess the important thing here is all Vonnie, Vonnie Life and Vinyl Link is digitized. Uh, it's basically ready. It's based, I guess, the, the all, that, that whole thing is done. And now it's in the um, it's in the proofreading stages. Um, Josiah Warren is helping out with that. Thank you, Josiah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I, had to, I had to make it, like, size 10 font. And it's almost 500 pages, which is the max for my publisher. So um, it'll be an eight and a half by eleven, 500 pages. This will be a damn textbook, um, Vonnie Life and Vonnie Link. Um, and it's yeah, obviously incredible as as 
I mean, you read Vonnie Life March 1973, Kyle. It's, you know what the, the caliber type of stuff that was in there. So, um, it yeah, definitely... it's unusually good, more so than usual. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, un- unusually good and unusually relevant today. So, um, yeah, that's the, the first one. Um, I don't know. hoping next year, it'll probably be next year sometime um, before Vonnie Life is released. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of books coming down the I guess come down the pike for LA publications. Um, yeah, a lot that I haven't haven't even really talked about. Um, but next, I guess in, in regards to the Vanu Zine digitization um, project, uh, is Preform Inform Nomads. Um, and Kyle, I'm not sure if you remember the I guess the chronology of of these publications, but they had the Preform Inform before was more kind of um, <clears throat> I guess you could say philosophical, and it might have been there might have been some you know political crusading nonsense in there, you know stuff like that. Um, but, uh, basically, you know, the, the economic, the, uh, they had to be super economical back then. So they basically just added nomads to the preform inform part because they had extra, um, they had extra like letterhead paper already printed, um, that said preform inform on it. So they couldn't waste it. So they just added nomads to the end of it. And that started like 1968. And that's when preform inform got hardcore, kind of like Vonu Life, um, which yeah, preform inform nomads predated Vonu Life by a little bit. Um, but yeah, that one's all digitized now. Um, it was more more so uh like Vonnie Life is more kind of I guess articles per se. Um but these are just letters and um you know like uh comment I guess letters and discussions between contributors. Um and I guess the the most valuable part of the preform inform um that I found was a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I've read whether it's Vonnie book 1 or Vonnie book 2 or the life of Tom Marshall. Um it doesn't always uh it doesn't it actually it never it didn't include a lot of the um the discussions he had with contributors. Um, and there's a lot of valuable stuff in there. Like I've already thought about like, you know, for the next two or three years, just taking out themes of Vani, like, um, you know, Rayo on whatever subject, and you could just pull out those articles in particular, those um, discussions in particular. Um, and yeah, done in the right editorial fashion. Um, these could all be super valuable, like, yeah, super valuable things. But um, yeah, again, that's that's down the road. There's, there's so many books that have to be fun. There was a year or two where I wasn't quite sure what I was going to publish, and now it's just like a fucking windfall. Um, which I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. Um, so I guess the the last one for I guess uh, the last one for now, and then I'll, I'll I'd like to love to get anything you have, Kyle. Um, this was an interesting find. I was going through all the everything I got from Jim Stum um, when he sent me his entire archive. And um, there were a few things, a few pieces in there. Um, and let me see if I can get get that pulled up. One 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 moment here. Yeah, sure. So something I just kind of want to reiterate the bullet search and all that. I believe it was Vonnie Life, 1974, I believe it was, where Old Man Rayo was basically trying to uh, experiment with different font sizes so he could so he could fit like more data into a smaller physically confined space and all that. There's a lot of good stuff that's in there. Um, it may not necessarily translate one to one today, but at least from a historical perspective, even if you just read it and never try to apply anything from there, it's still valuable for that one reason, where essentially it's almost like what we would understand to be using like a zip file where you basically uh, compress a lot of data together. He was trying to do something similar to like an old school version of it. It's actually rather quite ingenious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm definitely with you. I'm definitely with you. So this, so this was, um, this was, uh, I guess the first thing on the first, I guess the, was it the earliest one? It's called alternate dispute resolution. Um, it was by a, and I'm like uh, something Gill, um, in 1964. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it said preform confidential on the bottom. So this is only sent to probably, you know, very few people. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's only like 20 pages or something like that, but, um, I guess it's a very fascinating, um, I guess, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it's a, it seems, seems to be a, a pretty unique approach, um, that has, a, you know, it, was, it wasn't released to very, to very many people. So, um, that will be a part of, along with, with that, um, you remember the Frowls project, well, um, I have all of the like founding documents, I guess you could say, where they talk about, um, where uh, like the Association of Free Isles, um, they uh, like their government developer or development organizations, um, yeah, which I guess would be the Association of Free Isles, but um, they were you know highly highly influenced by Ayn Rand in that day, so they were trying to so, you know set up their model for quote unquote voluntary government. Um, you know, very much kind of, you know, using corporate, you know, corporate, I guess kind of corporate stuff to it too, so which is, which is common in, I guess, uh, seasetting projects. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's I'm not sure how much um, value this is as a, as a whole, other than like for archiving purposes to anybody, or just like you know if you're interested in libertarian history, um, you can check this check these out. Um, but I think the especially the alternate dispute resolution one might be of value. I'm, I'm gonna probably release that on its own on the podcast feed and an article format. And then uh, these other ones, um, I think there might actually be some. Um, I'm not you know much into the whole. To, and I'm not much more into like working the corporate structure stuff into it like they did. It's way too fucking complicated. Um, like they they went they made it way too complicated. But I think there's some things that could be applied to Pasnia because it's it's a similar model like the Association of Free Isles. It's like a decentralized network of free isles. Um, you know, among you know a common quote unquote voluntary government or however they however they word it. Um, and that's kind of what Pasnia is. Um, which again we'll we'll talk about this in more depth, Kyle. But yeah, it's it's a decentralized country there's you know amongst all jurisdictions um so yeah it's i, I think there's some things that can be applied um which yeah, i don't know I'm, I'm kind of excited for uh to get to get that one out there and that'll that'll be released first digitally um as a whole on the podcast feed and then i'll release um the dispute resolution one separately um and finally then i'll take a breath um the only thing left then to digitize uh is the rest of innovator um which i, I'll, I might get that done sometime Sometime in the next couple of few months. Um, it doesn't take that long. I've got a really, really um, good setup to digitize now, and uh, and I, t- I type 150 word plus words per minute, so it goes really, really fast. Um, I'm really surprised how fast um, that got done. So, um, and before even these releases, books, really publications, I need to get them out digitally anyway. So um, I'll probably I'm not going to release them on like the website or the podcast feed as a whole yet. But um, if you join the Pasnia Telegram, um, Pasnia Committee of Correspondence on Telegram. Um, or, uh, find us on, uh, oh God, what are the ones that we're on now? I can't even think, I think off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, find us, uh, find us one of our, uh, or maybe Noster actually, if you get, find me on Noster, DM me on Noster and I will, uh, um, send you a PDF of these beforehand. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'll take a breath. Yeah. Kyle, what do you got? No, I was just thinking about what you're saying. It actually reminded me of something I meant to say a moment ago. Um, You and I have talked about this privately. This one portion, I think we can say publicly. Part of unpacking for the move and all that is I've been looking over my library of physical books. And Shane, I think you'll be pleased to hear because this is the first time I'm telling you. Um, I've already set aside a pile for you. That's going to be the books I'm going to send to you because I've already read them. I already know what's in it. It's, I don't think it's necessarily like how-to material necessarily that I can, that I really need for reference. But I also don't want to give it away or sell it away or, God forbid, donate to the Lagavista Pub- Vista Public Library, which is right. the last thing I want to do. So um, I've already got a pile. It's not ready to ship yet. Probably won't be for at least another week or two. But I've already got a pile of books that I'm going to be sending you to because you were interested about digitizing. Uh, at least having the physical, co- physical copies is not uh, possibly digitizing it, depending if you think it's worth the time and effort or not. So. I figure I might as well announce that and kind of pleasantly surprise you at the same time. Hey, cheers, man. Yes, um, that's 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 really appreciated. Um, obviously, yeah, contributions to the Pasni Library are always open. Um, and just to yeah provide that brief synopsis for anyone who's, who doesn't know the, I guess, the vision. Um, obviously, you have all these available, you know, people who come to Veritas, we've got all these books here. Um, and when we get to, um, we get to the embassy, not, we're at the, the Pasni Consulate now, when we get to the embassy, um, there'll probably be a, you know, a proper bigger bookcase. So um, there'll be more more room for this to be displayed. Um, so yeah, any contributions are appreciated. Thank you, Kyle. And then obviously the goal, um, or I guess not obviously, but the goal down the road would be to, um, yeah, digitize all of these. And then every single Pasnia would basically, it's like, uh, you know, seeding IPFS nodes or something like we all, we all seed like everything on the Pasnia network is seeded amongst Pasnia. So there's so much redundancy there. Um, even if you only have 20 or 30 around the world, like that's still, um, still massive. Um, still massive so um yeah eventually the digit i guess the the digitization would be uh, would would definitely be the goal um and then um to, i guess to the opposite of that a lot of the stuff that we have digitally a lot of these books that are not that are super hard to find in print or you can't find in print anymore um the opposite of that and actually printing those out and getting physical copies of that but that'd be way down the road um we'd have to have our open source printing press and that does not exist here yet um not really feasible time or <laughs> investment wise so um, hey, at least hey, at least it's on the proverbial bucket list, in a manner of speaking, right? Hey, yeah, it's it's got to be a vision before it can, <laughs> before it can ever come into reality. So it's kind of like the uh, um, it's kind of like the uh, you know the aircraft carriers, the floating hotels. 
Um, like, oh, uh, yes. yeah, I mean, just, it's, I'm still hopeful. Um, Hey, I want my underwater uh, Freeport city of uh, kind of like that one video game with that rapture in it. I want that. I mean, like, why not, right? If you've got enough people and resources, and depending on your uh, mean time level, your your MTH, your mean time or harassment, like, mm -hmm. I suppose the sky's the limit, I suppose. But then again, you also have to scale up. And this is where people kind of screw up. And it's not just in terms of, you know, MTH, uh, you know, in an academic or formal sense or even a statistical sense, but also like in a day-to-day -day sense, right? You can't just go from uh, like a tot, like a little baby. You can't just go from crawling to running a marathon, right? You have to crawl before you can walk, and then you actually have to walk a lot, and then eventually you can jog a little bit. It's, it's, it's all incremental. And, and, you know, it's like the phrase, um, the old adage that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. And same thing here. Uh, you can't just, uh, you know, with our Vanuist mini cultures, you can't just, you know, just snap your fingers and make it happen. Okay, this isn't some fucking Avengers movie. Um, you actually have to, like, build things over time if you're going to do it and do it right. Much like mm -hmm. raising a family, actually, and not an entirely inaccurate comparison. You know, it's, it's a worthwhile thing that takes time. Yeah, certainly, certainly, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess the, the final thing, um, for, I guess the, this isn't related to the digitization project, but it relates to Vanu life. Um, and I don't think I've told you about this yet, Kyle. Uh, maybe I don't think I, I don't think I shared the link with you or anything, but, um, okay. yeah, when I, when I finished digitizing Vanu life, it was, uh, you know, obviously 500 pages, completely massive. Um, it was kind of with, you know, with kind of sadness that it was over. And then I had the, the thought, um, I had the thought. So much like Vanu Life, March 1973, which was, um, it wasn't like a monthly or, you know, bi-monthly publication or anything. Um, it was once a year. Um, so I had the idea, and I've already put out the announcement. Um, it's already, uh, yeah, people want to check it out, vanupodcast.com forward slash VL2025. Um, but basically in 2025, Vanu Life will be resurrected. Um, it will have a, for, and then I guess the goal would be once a year, um, we, you know, contributors um, in the same model, same fashion, uh, contribute articles. Um, and then we put them together and release them as, uh, you know, Vanu Life, uh, um, and we'll, we'll continue from, uh, I think we'll, so we'll, where Vanu Life ended and where Vanu Link picked up, I think we'll pick up the, the Vanu Life numbering there, um, and just continue it at that point. Um, so I don't know what that'd be, Vanu Life 12 or whatever that, whatever, whatever it would be. Um, and yeah, I, I, so I guess that's the, the big announcement is that Vanu Life will come back in 2025. Um, so I guess that it gives um, anyone, any, any contributors a long time. Um, I think I said um, ch -ch -ch, uh, any submissions must be made by July 1st, 2025. So lots of time, um, lots of time um, to ponder and to, to write and edit and all that sort of stuff um, for anyone out there. Um, and Kyle, if you have any articles you'd like to submit, um, obviously would, 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 would definitely love it. Um, and I guess to, I've got the, of that, course, yeah, I'll, I've got the, yeah, I've got, the, I've got the post up here and I'll, and so I'll mention again for your, uh, for your benefit and also for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but so section one will be situation and searches, um, which would be lifestyle reports from self liberators, um, a report about your liberated lifestyle, things you've learned, your goals, will let you to vanuism, self liberation, et cetera. Um, or reviews of books, equipment, organizations, um, tips and tricks, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, information that you feel is valuable to pass on. Um, and then section two, uh, general strategy. So that'd be like Vonnie Life March 1973, essentially, where, where it's just those hard hitting like strategy articles. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe partially how to or whatever. Um, but yeah, I guess topics, van nomadism, pedestrian nomadism, wilderness Vanu, international travel, family and children, additional communities, new country projects, financial independence, health liberation, uh, Vanu in cities, um, underground shelters and troglodytism, um, and then more modern ones today that I guess that, that was more the ones that were sought out back then, which we still want. Um, but I guess beyond that, private communications, sovereign networking, um, Vanuing the cities in the 2020s, because that's obviously quite a bit different um, with how dystopic um, a lot of... Um, big cities are getting nowadays um alternative housing solutions um etc so i mean the list is pretty much endless um but that's to to give people an idea um and yeah again july 1st 2025 is the submission date um or i guess the submission deadline um but yeah go ahead Kyle. my bad for jumping in there no 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 i was the only thing i was gonna add to that is uh i you know i <laughs> Time depending, but I think once the new, I'm done on the new job, I'll probably have some 
time to actually go have a life and such. And one of that's going to be writing articles, kind of like I used to uh, several years ago. I think I think I might just write one article for every section you mentioned because I was thinking about those sections you brought off. I'm like, well, I have I could say a couple things about that and a couple of things about the others, and also probably more importantly in some ways, some stuff not to do, which is pretty much a lot of stuff I did do. So, um, you know, I I think I'll probably just do like an article per section probably. <laughs> yeah. Hey man, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um... Yeah, whatever is great. Whatever is great, and obviously, I I would I would encourage anyone um, to submit anything. I don't know if I'll end up getting ten submissions or if, or if or if I'll get a hundred. Um, so yeah, obviously, um, and and shit. If even if stuff doesn't make it into the the first, you know, like uh, I I don't know, like it, it may get to a point where they're they're you know, hey, more books, um, like a backlog, maybe like a like a yeah, I don't know, a, yeah, backlog of articles or submissions or, or whatever. Yeah, there's no nothing wrong with um, I like with like with Rayo um, in the in the sixties and seventies, uh, if he could uh, at, at some point he would get him in there, um, get him in there. It's just yeah, it's, there's only so much space um, in the printed format, um. But yeah, so I mean that's that's uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's kind of the uh, so I got cats running around or I got a cat in the studio. I just got to keep eyes on um, every once in a while. But um, yeah, I guess that's the I guess the, the big stuff with um, digitization. I'm I'm almost done. I I feel like uh, I made that I made that uh, <laughs> obligation to Jim when he sent those to me, and I I you know I didn't really I didn't really have like I guess the time or energy or I guess. Um, desire to do it up until a few months ago, and it's pretty much done now. So I'm, I've, my obligation is almost complete, um, <laughs> at least in that realm, um, which is good. I thought it'd be another five or ten years, but um, yeah, I guess that that wraps up that. Any any anything uh, on Bonnie zines or digitization or anything else before I jump forward to the I suppose the last thing I have for this for this evening this afternoon. Let's let's go ahead and jump to the next thing. I didn't have anything more than that. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Um, so political prisoner update. Um, I guess, so I will pull up the text I sent you to, uh, let me see. When was that? Um, okay. So, um, I'll pull up the political prisoners archive too, um, which will be necessary because there's a new one on there. It's been revived, but we'll get to that momentarily. <laughs> oh, joy. Um, okay, so um, I guess uh, um, we can yeah, run through. So Kevin, yeah, I guess the Kevin Casey Massey, um, he was, uh, I guess, featured, uh, you know, we were kind of did an homage to political prisoners in the last episode of uh, the Vonnie podcast. And uh, we featured him for uh, for about 11 minutes. Uh, was it about 11 minutes? Something like that. Um, to tell a story and uh, to, you know, kind of give an homage because, yeah, I mean, well, we know we know the conclusion to Kevin Casey Massey's case, unfortunately. Um, yeah, he, yeah, he, he, yeah, he's, he's gone now. Um, uh, so then, yeah, Ross Ulbricht is the next one. Yeah, us, all those crypto anarchists know Ross Ulbricht's situation is not any better. Uh, William Wolf, uh, was actually released in May 2020, so that's a good thing. Um, that's a positive. Um, mm -hmm. and Skylar Barbeau was released in November of 2017. Uh, no kidding. Finally, Barbeau's yep. free now. Damn. Yep. Yep. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Uh, and the other, uh, I hope I put it in the show notes of that. Or else I'll have to do a quick search, um, because uh, I showed in the uh, at a, in a screenshot at the end of that video. Um, for those who listened in the video format, you wouldn't have seen it. But um, let me see if I linked that. Nope, I don't think so. Um, I will pull it up here uh, real quick. But um, uh, Kyle, do you want to give like a? Uh, um, you might give a better a better explanation uh, than I did um, in last episode. But you like uh, is it is it? Put you on the spot. A couple minute overview of the, um, I guess the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom and the Malheur situation. Oh I God! Yeah, I can, do, I can do this one on the fly. God, these fucking people. Okay, so <laughs> Citizens for Constitutional Freedom, also in the C4SS, uh, or some acronym to that effect, were basically the actual activist organization name for a bunch of right wing people that. Went to the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge back basically right before the Donalds got elected to be El Presidente. And their whole issue was a kind of obnoxious smattering of things about land use issues. They opposed BLM. No, not that BLM. The other BLM, the federal BLM, Bureau of Land Management. 
Um, and basically, they were just kind of rehashing uh, essentially what became the latest version of the so-called the range wars and all that, which has been a long-standing issue with the federal government because the federal government likes to, you know, they 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 like to play games with land, and it's not just the various, um, you know, Native American peoples. It's not just with you know, breaking treaties, it's not just, not just, not just. They also like to screw over even the so-called gringo farmers and, and all that. Um, because the federal government is very, very greedy when it gets when it comes to land. I mean, that's just been a long-standing thing that's not contested. That is not a, even a hidden history thing. It's literally just even a main mainline, mainstream history thing. And so if you don't remember the Bundy ranch, the so-called Bundy Ranch standoff, which actually occurred in Bunkerville, uh, I believe it was New Mexico, I believe, um, Back in 2014, uh, some of the guys for C4, uh, C4SS were actually involved with that because that's when it first started coalescing. Because the main result of the Bundy of the so-called Bundy Ranch standoff was uh, the fact that the feds backed off, and so it kind of gave all the right-wing people basically this kind of victory kind of thing, or at least a sense of victory. And yeah, the Fed, it is true that the feds. We found this out after the fact. The feds basically were kind of sore about that. And really what happened was that Malaher was essentially Bundy Ranch round two, where the feds got their revenge. Um, this is where the murder of a boy Sinicum happened, who I wrote an extensive unauthorized biography of because he had, because Sinicum specifically had made a series of videos where he was detailing his very political beliefs, well, a lot of which involved land use issues both relating to him personally as well as more general <coughs> excuse me <coughs> as well as more um as well as more generally and all that actually can we pause for a sec i need yeah, yeah, some water yeah, please do please do yeah, yeah hey so sorry about that i didn't mean to do that in the middle of things oh no that's that's okay i needed to, i was still trying to find i couldn't find the article same it's it's so you you know the the problem with finding stuff on the internet and shit disappearing, but it happens like you can put in the same exact search result on a search engine like a day or two later. Yeah. And not find anything that you yeah. found before. So yeah, it's Yeah, it's, it's the uh, it's funny you mentioned that. So I've been noticing that too. We're basically a lot of what we we used to consider the free and open internet is now becoming an Orwellian um, memory hole. There we go. It's, okay. it's right. literally just disappearing. And not only that, there's some degree of what some people would call dead internet theory that may or may mm -hmm. not be applicable here. I don't oh, have a yeah. firm answer on that yet, but it is something I'm keeping an eye on because there's also like the weird AI chatbots that are populating the so-called dating apps and even other apps that aren't focused on dating. They're also using that. And there's also some indications that they're actually being either used by or otherwise working in conjunction with certain, um, uh, un, as of right now, we're going to keep them unnamed foreign hostile superpowers that are trying to engage in espionage. So those are topics for another time, but the short version is, if you're having trouble finding articles, I'm kind of not surprised because there's some other weird internet-related stuff I'm noticing too on my end. And right. I don't have a firm answer on a lot of it, but... This is stuff is not normal because, yeah, occasionally stuff would go missing or somebody would delete their blog or whatever or, or a YouTube channel would get taken down by a corporate or something. But that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about normal stuff just here one day, gone the next with no explanation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's – yeah, it's yeah and, and obviously it doesn't even matter what search engine um, you use at this point, unfortunately. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, there, there are open source solutions. Um, that 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 are I think like uh, I guess the one one that a lot of the crypto po folks tout is I guess uh, pre search and then there's uh, uh, there was one that that Matthew Amer is promoting back and like he's been promoting it for like six or seven years but I don't remember what that one's called but anyway yeah it's 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 problematic yeah. um, but but anyway so I I what I had to do I had to resort to going back to the video because I could not find the original article um, so I was I failed on that one but I got what I needed. Um, and basically, this is the um, and and what the, so the, the 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 way I worked it this into the SW and Tdev podcast for the Samurai Wallet folks, which I'll I'll tell you about here momentarily, um, is that um, in this other situation, like you know where you know patriots went and you know wielded weapons and on federal land against you know federal agents essentially in multiple on multiple occasions, not just once. 
Um, as long as you didn't take a plea deal, like the government was operating in such a corrupt manner that they basically had to like they they had to do what they they had to let him go. Um, so I guess the the final I guess the I, um the final word on it this was I think this is a 2017 article. Uh, end of uh, I guess it would have been like a a few day a day or two after October 27th, 2016, maybe. Um, I don't remember again. I don't remember the source, and I didn't put it. Fucking dumb me. Um, but anyway, uh, so a federal jury today delivered its verdicts against four defendants charged with conspiracy, possession of firearms on federal property, and depredation of government property during the 41-day armed occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Jurors found Jason Patrick guilty of conspiracy to beat officers. Um, well, I'm not going to read the entire thing. Daryl uh, Thorne was found guilty. Uh, Dwayne Emmer was found not guilty. Uh, and Jake Ryan was found not guilty. Um, and co-defendants, uh, Ammon Bundy, Ryan Bundy, Shauna Cox, David Fry, Jeff Banta, Kenneth Mendenbach, and Neil Wampler were previously found not guilty on all counts by a jury on October 27, 2016. Um, so I guess it might have been a couple months after, but, um, just cutting in there, a couple months after October 27th. But, uh, co-defendants, Jason Blomgren, uh, Blomgren, Brian Cavalier, Blaine Cooper, Eric Flores, Wesley Kishar, Corey LeCue, Joseph O'Shaughnessy, Ryan Payne, John Ritzheimer, Jeffrey Stanek, Travis Cox, uh, Dylan Anderson, Sandra Anderson, and Sean Anderson previously pleaded guilty. Um, so basically, um, the ones found not guilty on all counts did not take the plea deal. Um, and obviously the ones that, like, they, I mean, so if, if the other folks wouldn't have taken plea deals, I remember Ritzenheimer, Ritzenheimer taking his plea deal. Um, you know, if they, if they would have just held, if, if they just would have held strong, um, yeah. they probably would have gotten off. Um, they very likely would have gotten off, but now they're federal you know they're felons in possession with firearms now if they have them so um that's that's such a and um that's such a like if even if you're especially if you're like a 2a patriot not being able to legally own firearms is like cutting off your dick um essentially so like that's yeah, that's and, and, and that's funny, a bad deal and funny you mention that because rick Heimer in in for people who don't know about his background he used to be uh youtube famous for a little while before he stopped being youtube famous and it's funny you mentioned about getting his dick cut off, or it might as well have been. Because remember, this was the guy whose primary mm-hmm. political speech prior to Malaher was all about, it was, it was very Islamophobic. I'm not going to yeah. beat around the bush. Shooting so Qurans, yeah. Stated. Yeah, he was a real asshole. He, he, he's a bigot. He, he's a real one. And he was unapologetic about it. So there wasn't a lot of beating around the bush. There was no coding language. He straight up said some very inflammatory stuff against people of that specific religion. Uh, That's thing number one. Thing number two, the dick's getting cut off. During Malaher, a lot of weird shit happened. Oh, God bless it. You and I actually broke the story. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, my God. I'm totally remembering, hey, you brought about a dick getting caught off, and I'm going to fucking bring it up, because this was a fucking weird shit when it happened, and your reaction is perfect for everybody who haven't had this yet a chance yet to listen to the older podcast. But the the thing autographed about the dildos. Is, God damn it. And there was that, too. Oh, my God. There was a lot of weird dick-related shit related to Malaher, by the way, folks. Just, just FYI. If you haven't gone back and listened to the archive, I suggest you would. But we'll keep it short here. Yes, remember Ritzheimer with the whole, he was opening the bag of dicks thing because somebody sent in the bag. Uh, one of the, some of the people who were disagreeing with the protesters basically sent in the bag of dicks so they could eat it. And then, yes, there was there was the other thing that you were mentioning. Oh, if you want to enlighten the listeners about that one, too. All, all I remember, it was uh, it was like an Oregon militia, I think it was. Um, and they yes, like they auto, they it. autographed them and are like going to raise money, like like autograph. Yeah, they were. Uh, Yep, they were going to do that too. That yeah, so there was that, so yeah, there's there's there were separate penis related accoutrement things that were related to Malaher. And this is something the corporate media never brought up because I guess they didn't think it was funny enough or interesting enough or just or in, as I think of it, it's, it's just plain p- weird. It's bizarre. I don't like it's 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 I don't know why I did. Yeah. Right. Just bizarre. Right. What what do dildos and candy dicks have anything to do with federal land use policy? And yeah, that probably should go on a bumper sticker somewhere, but you see what I'm saying. <laughs> Christ. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Christ is right. Exactly. I mean, this is the kind of insanity of the first realm. This is why we're trying to get away from all that, build a second realm, you know, the Agora and all that. Because by the time this is fucking clown world. Mm-hmm. With 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 the with with the dicks that 
you know, it just look when they did stuff in a birdcage. And again, I'm sorry that Finnegan was murdered. I really am, and that's a serious thing, and that's not a joking manner, especially considering the way that it happened. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, there's like footage of that. You can also, folks, you can also look at the Shauna Cox footage from inside the pickup truck, so you can actually see Finnegan getting out and all that. Uh, the long and the short of it, folks, is that that whole that whole thing that we that Shane and I and even Gary Hunt covered regarding Malaher was just so freaking bizarre. The corporate media so badly screwed that up. And that's before we get into the weird shit that was the lead up to that, like when they were establishing a committee of safety that then distance that even the guys of Citizens for Constitutional Freedom were then like disobeying their orders. Like there was some other weird shit going on. And the corporate media, of course, didn't even bother to mention any of that, which actually was relevant to the story about why those protesters were there and why they brought their firearms because they were disagreeing with federal land use policy. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, ironically, by going to the birdcage, they of course made themselves so incredibly highly vulnerable to coercion. Their mean time to harassment dropped to fucking zero. And then some. It dropped to like minutes and minutes and hours. Yeah, like minutes. Well, no, yeah, negatives (laughs) actually. Yeah, negatives. Yeah. Um, Well, now they're being actively hunted like fugitives, especially when you consider the final four. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's a negative mean time to harassment for sure. Um, Oh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, no, th- yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for filling there for a minute or two. While I, I located things and, and yeah, thanks for the background and for bringing up things I, I totally forgot about. Um, there's so many, I guess like, the highlight, the, of, your, God I guess the highlight of your day talking about like gummy candy dicks and, and signing dildos. I mean, that whole situation was just bizarre years ago. And, and you know, I'm glad we covered it at the time when we did because all these years later we can now reference it and people can see that we were telling the truth even now, about what we said back then, because it was all documented. We saved the videos and stuff and all that, mm-hmm. uh, and pictures and whatever else. So we're just not making shit up. That's how crazy... This is why I don't like protesters, just in general. They do the weirdest shit. And these guys were particularly unique in the way that they did it. Say what you will about the Black Lives Matter people. Say what you will about the Tea Party people. Say what you will about Occupy Wall Street or any one of 1,020 million political activist types who I disagree with. The guys, the, the one unique thing about the guys who sat at the birdcage was that there was just this recurring theme about dildos and candy dicks. Like, it was so just clown worldish. All these years later, I still remember it. <laughs> and you can, and you guys too, on your own time, can go look this up and you know, check the older parts of the website too and all that, and you'll see exactly what we wrote. Like, actually, you wrote an article too about it as well, I think, um, at the time when we wrote about it. It, it was just, it's just crazy. It is crazy, crazy shit. Certainly, um, yeah. But I, I, there, there were some, I guess, some good parts of it too, like the Harney County Committee of Safety. Even though you know it was negative for some ways, the the fact that it came into came into fruition was a was a, a valuable thing, um, which was released on the Bonnie Podcast sure. feed. Um, we don't need to get into that necessarily. I, I have done, so I, I have released some stuff on committees, committees of safety on the Bonnie Podcast feed. Um, cause I'm sure there are, cause Vaughnism isn't exclusive to anarchists. Um, you know, there are anarchists, Venuans out there. Like it's, I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in, in terms per se, but, um, you know, whatever it is, if they're pursuing self-liberation and they, and they want some strategies in that vein, then you know, I'll toss them out. Why not? Um, but, uh, but anyway, I guess the, um, yeah, I mean, it was good, good, good to reflect on the, on the Malier stuff, but I think we need to, yeah, we need to move forward now. Um, <laughs> sure. yeah, lots of hours, yeah, lots of hours on that back then, but, um, so what I'll, I'll, I'll mention here just briefly is the, the next step in the, in the crypto wars. Um, and I guess, how, how are you on time? Cause we've been going for like an hour and four and this might take, um, there is some, and it's, cause I, we could save this for, for another one. Um, cause there's, um, it's kind of an update on the crypto war. Um, there's, um, Bitcoin privacy. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a few elements to this. And then there's also, um, going back to like, uh, um, our articles on judicial transparency, um, you know, the reason for the political prisoners archive, um, there are some, right. um, some very helpful tools nowadays. Um, and I, I would, again, I'd, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to take a moment to reflect, I'd, I'd like to take an ex- more than just a minute or two to reflect on, on those things. So we, it might be better if we save this towards, for like a, its own podcast, maybe, because um, there's some some really very mind. helpful iterations on judicial transparency. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, if you don't mind, maybe let's do that a week from now, same time, same Batman channel, and we'll definitely go over Crypto Wars, whatever DOJ's been fucking around with, whatever they're, you know, and, and whatever, you know, import-export controls they're attempting to do, as well as as well as that other thing. I, I think that, need, and the, the reason for the um, political prisoners archive and all that, I think that needs its own time. Yeah, and I unfortunately, agree. I was about to, unfortunately, I was about to go off to a thing shortly after we're done here. Yeah. Um, but I did want to mention briefly about what I what I heard in, in the, the the church that I went through earlier. Please I do, think yeah, it's yeah. Kind of in, in some ways, and I think that might be the best thing to end out on, if that's good with you. Um, which was basically um, so this minister basically goes up to the pulpit at one point, and um, she basically goes up and says something to the effect of giving a speech about uh, there was some sort of ritual involving flowers earlier that took place during the service. It was something about uh, springtime and we're unique, beautiful people or something like that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> something about the grace of love and God or something. I, to be honest, I was kind of in and out for that part. But the part that I, I refocused my attention was when she said the following statement, which sounded a little political for a religious setting, but historically, even if you go back in like the 17th, 16th centuries and so forth, uh, Protestant ministers kind of have a habit of doing political stuff, and he could even be argued that uh, the Sons of Liberty originally uh, got some inspiration from some of the local preachers. So, like, historically, that part's not crazy. It's just funny for me to kind of see this, like, oh, well, the history is repeating itself. Next thing you know, we're going to go to the equivalent of the Green Dragon Tavern. Next thing you know, we're going to be doing shit with tea, and next thing you know, we're going to have militias. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's almost following the uh, same patterns, right, in some ways. <laughs> you know, those gall, gall darn god fearing people, they have some problems, right? As as some folks would say. Uh, more bureaucrats and folks who don't want people to be free and independent. But anyway, so the minister basically said some of the effect of, will our faith, our theology, be strong and resilient enough to defeat fascism? Hmm. Let me say that one more time because I want to unpack that. Will our faith, be resilient enough to defeat fascism. It was something to that effect. Hmm. And I'm just sitting here thinking, like, I think I know what she's trying to say, but I think it was a combination poor word choice and a few other things. So I, I want to give her some leeway, right? Because obviously, as we all know, well know, fascism is basically corptocracy. It's basically the marriage of state and corporate power, right? It's um, a lot of pork barrel spending. It's a lot of corporate tax breaks and a lot of stuff that leftists correctly do mention. Um, but I don't think religious faith has anything to do with whether any particular Fortune 500 company meets its, you know, quarterly projections or whatever their profit margins are, right, for a particular quarter. I don't think the one has anything to do with the other. I want somebody would like to correct me. Um, I don't, I, I think we're kind of talking non sequiturs here to some degree. So I don't think we're talking, I don't think she meant fascism properly defined. So can we, we can just put a little bow on that, put it off to the corner. I, I think we can pretty much uh, deal with that right away. I think what she meant to say was bigotry and prejudice, right? A genuine type of, not even so much hatred, but more disgust towards demographics of people that are not you. Um, psychologists refer to this as othering but basically whether it's the demographic kaleidoscope and I'm not going to talk specific. I'm going to keep this very generalized because it's the concept that's more important here. And the demographic kaleidoscope, whatever the intersectionality of whatever characteristics that you either have or don't have or might have, uh, you're just othering people, right? Again, this is not to say you need to, you know, accept people in the sense of getting together and learning the 20 million details about each other's lives and, stand together and think kumbaya, but what it does mean is uh, essentially negative liberty, right? You can't murder them. You can't steal from them. You can't enslave them. You can't violently oppress them. Uh, you can't, um, uh, basically, it, it violates the non-aggression principle, right? You can't violate the non-aggression principle just because you don't like the Pacific, kaleido uh, the kaleidoscopic demographic characteristics of people that are not you, if that makes sense. Hmm. I think that's what she was trying to get at, um, and and she just said, "Will our faith be resilient enough to to defeat uh, bigotry and prejudice?" And all I'm thinking is, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking like, okay, so if I'm just kind of like redefining things so that it's more accurate, 
unfortunately, I'm inclined to answer. And she, and she claimed, oh, I don't know what the answer is, but my faith and my hope is that, yes, our faith is strong enough to defeat fascism. And all I'm thinking is like, okay, first of all, I think she means well. But second of all, I'm kind of thinking in my head here, like, if she's really talking about prejudice and, and bigotry, and I'm talking the real kind, okay, just to keep this simple. Um, let's say let's say Ritzheimer is Islamophobia, okay? That's a real form of bigotry and prejudice, just to make that crystal clear, tie this in with the other thing, right? Um, will our faith be resilient enough? The real answer is that it depends. It depends on a lot of things because it depends on your so-called society, your civilization, what the norms are. If the norms of your civilization actually value human liberty, then you do have a genuine... Uh, uh, probability of of any sort of bigotry or prejudice, not necessarily not existing, but more being contained and kept in its box, and shall we say kept more underground to the point where even if some people don't like somebody else's demographic characteristics of whatever the fuck, it's kind of a, not a big deal because they keep it low key and it's out of the public square and it doesn't really affect anything for the most part. Um, and once the social justice warriors want to come in and like, you know, disagree with me about that and provide 20 million examples as they see fit, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, at what point are we kind of broaching this as thought crime, right? I'm, I'm not going doing the thought crime thing here because that, that's a little too fascist for me. Um, I'm just saying if somebody is spouting like racial slurs kind of thing, like openly in public, it's like, yeah, okay, probably shouldn't do that. Um, and it's more of an issue of keeping the peace. Right, because there's the issue of incitement and and so forth. So if you're spouting slurs, um, there's a risk of incitement. There's the notion of fighting words, and you don't even necessarily have to be in a bar with alcohol involved. Even if you're at the fucking grocery store, and you call people of a darker skin color a certain slur, then yeah, don't be surprised if they try to execute a hip throw. Just don't be surprised. They'll try not to. And I even saw it happen earlier this week, by the way. Um, but that, that's kind of where it's at, right? There, there is a notion about keeping the peace. And what does that necessarily entail? And it's not an excuse for censorship. It's more, it's more in the context of uh, not all truths need to be said. And again, keeping the peace. Like, again, we do free speech with this whole thing, right? This is about as free speech as it gets. I mean, we're pretty much going into the arena of absolutist free speech because we're opposing the state, right? Or we're trying to replace the state. And it's about as dangerous as you can fucking get. I'm just going to call it spade a spade here, okay? Especially when we talk about, like, the second realm, where we talk about the agora or black markets and so forth. Um, we do this because we care about humanity in the long term. However, when other people who are uh, prejudiced and bigoted are, are, are slinging slurs because they don't like people that, are, that they prefer to other, that's not a love of humanity at all. In fact, you could say it is a genuine form of disgust with humanity to the extent where they want to cause discord and disrupt uh, the peace of the community, as it were. Okay, that's not, that, and I guess at that point, I guess they wouldn't be two steps away from stringing people up. And not stringing people up as a form of punishment or as a way of curbing statism, as it were, if we were in the middle of evolution, but they would be stringing people up because they like to murder. Last time I checked, that was a crime, a real one, you know, with actual victims. So what I'm trying to say here, Shane, is I think the minister was kind of on the right track to some degree, but the way that she was phrasing it and a lot of the implications, because I kind of got the impression she was a leftist, to be perfectly honest. Um, and of the type of church that I kind of went into, I got to confirm that, yeah, they're pretty leftist. They do talk about social justice a lot, just so that's the context. Mm. But I was really thinking about what she was saying about, will our faith be resilient enough to defeat fascism? And all I'm thinking is, like, you are really kind of making a lot of assumptions, because you could also go back to, like, the tradition of Leo Tolstoy, uh, uh, Leo Tolstoy uh, the Christian anarchist, a pacifist tradition. Uh, or the flag for the, well, the triangle flag for that one would be what? It's, it's black and white, I think it is. Because the different schools of anarchism have the different flags with the triangle thing. There's like a whole list of it. And so the Christian anarchists would be part of that tradition. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, 
You can't have that belief, but last time I checked, the Christian anarchist tradition hasn't really brought about the end of the state. I mean, technically, none of us have. Even the black flaggers of us haven't. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know, I'm leaning more towards peace or superior firepower, but that's just me. Um, but, but again, like I said, will our faith build resilience enough to defeat fascism? It depends. What's the culture like? If you have a culture like, like the First Realm is right now, where it's a lot of manipulation, it's a lot of deceit, it's a lot of lying, there's a lot of self-delusion, and also there's just a lot, a lot of the reason why people are stated is because they're mentally ill. A lot of it is, especially when you look at the public schools that not up until very recently, I was literally guarding with my life. Um, there's a lot of mental illness, there's a lot of child abuse of various flavors and forms that range from neglect to full-blown, the actual real abuse where they're like beating kids with a belt kind of thing. And so it's like, of course, they're going to run the daddy government when they're older and they want special favors. They want handouts in the welfare state and they want their no bid contracts with Halliburton if they're more of the military kind. Like no wonder because their own family failed them. That's why. So if that's the norm for your culture, then no, your faith is not going to be resilient enough to defeat that because you have all these other institutional actors, all these other pressures, all these other social forces that outweigh whatever your faith is. And at this point, it's not an issue whether your faith is real or not. Okay, we're not having an atheist discussion here. That's not what this is. What this is, is if your personal convictions about metaphysics, let's put it that way, is that resilient enough to defeat fascism, it depends. It absolutely depends. If everybody around you had a similar conviction, and more importantly, that your culture was more supportive of human liberty in general, then yeah, it would defeat statism. It would defeat a lot of evils that are a threat to human liberty. But then on the other end, of course, your mean time to harassment would be very high, of course. Sorry, to bring this back to Vanu. Mm -hmm. Your mean time to harassment would be very high, of course. But then if it's the other way around, which I would suggest it is with the servile society, that with a lot of mentally ill people who, are sta who become statists, because they're mentally ill, because they are abused, a lot of them, maybe not every single one, but a lot of them are, then yeah, uh, no, your faith is not going to be resilient enough because they are already so hard, in, uh, so deeply invested in the system. They're so inured that they will fight to protect it. And no pacifist, no matter how well-meaning, is going to, like, uh, as the old phrase goes, you know, put a flower in the barrel of a soldier's gun and that's going to defeat them. I'm sorry. I'm, I, maybe it's the line of work that I do, but I, I don't see that happening, unfortunately. Um, it's one thing to talk to people and try to persuade them and convince them. I've done that with suspects back when I worked apartment security two employers ago. But there's also other people that are so far gone, no amount of words, no amount of rational discussion, no amount of dare shall I say it, even brotherly love, is enough to bring people back from the, the brink of the abyss. And, and especially if they've fallen into the abyss, they're already too far gone. And now you have to make life and death decisions if they escalate the use of force, if it's something extreme like that, like I deal with at work. So I hope that makes sense. Does our faith, is our faith resilient enough to defeat fascism? It absolutely depends. And that, that question of hers really stuck with me all day today, as you can see, that I'm even bringing it up now, because it seemed very naive the way she originally phrased it. Like, why just fascism? I mean, funny, she could have just as easily said, think about it this way, Shane, she could have just as easily said, is our faith resilient enough to defeat communism? Because last time I checked, communism was still around. But she didn't say that, did she? Right. Hmm. Yeah, so a little bit of a left as much because she said fascism and not the properly understood fascism, but the fascism of like something like KKK or something, which isn't fascism. You see what I mean? It's just like, it's like all I'm thinking is like girlfriend, just you have the kernel of a good idea, just rewrite it, deliver the sermon next week. If I had a chance to talk to her, I probably would have said that. I decided not to <laughs> out of respect for my friend that, that brought me. It's like, girlfriend, please, don't, don't play a player. Don't do this. That's all I would say, Dean, to be perfectly honest. It's like, it's like Jesus Christ. Um, no, just, just no. And that's all I'm going to say is it was an interesting thought, but I thought about it for more than five minutes, 
And now you heard the little speech I just gave, basically dissecting it six ways come Sunday. And it's like, she's oversimplifying something that's actually a little bit more genuinely complicated. Because it is true. It does depend. Because in some cases, yes, you can be a prisoner and a gulag. And maybe your faith will be resilient enough to at least keep you alive. It's not going to defeat the gulag itself, but it very well may keep you motivated enough to like not take your life while you're in a gulag. So in that sense, yes, faith would help you, or at least help some people. Sure, of course. Everything in its proper place and its proper function. And we can debate these things mm -hmm. as to which things are in their proper place and their proper function. But she's very much doing that. But the minister, unfortunately, I think was very much doing a silver bullet thing. Our faith will defeat fascism, was kind of implied. And it's like, mm, no, girlfriend, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I've lived too long. I've seen too much. My line of work also doesn't help either. Uh, the short answer is no, in that sense. I mean, the real answer, like I said, is it depends. But, like, I don't know. Um, I kind of feel sorry for a lot of leftists now. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if it has something to do with the upcoming election cycle, which some of them have been mentioning to me about. I'm like, okay, first of all, stop the voting. And so we're back to the whole reformism shit from years ago. Back to Again, 2015. My first yeah, we're going back to that. And I'm like, I'm just going to short circuit this right real quick. I've been telling them just stop voting. things, And basically a lot of stuff we've talked about over the years, I kind of been running them through it a lot. And that seems to work, by the way, per, per, uh, private, uh, personal conversation, excuse me, private conversation with some per, uh, locals here in the area. That does seem to work. Um, and I've had some successes with that. So I didn't mean to belabor the point because I do have to get going here shortly. But yeah. yeah. Seriously, man, the question about is our faith resilient enough to, re to defeat fascism, it's like, wow, that's kind of naive. It's also the wrong question to ask, but because like I said a moment ago, you could have just switched it with communism. But oh no, can't say that because that's too right-wing, right? Of course, the better way to have said it would be just statism, right? Just like, I mean, <laughs> kind of like that other, that other phrase, hatred of the state is love for humanity. Oh, can't talk about that because they, they like their welfare state, right? Or they like the warfare state, right? There, there's always some there's always some ulterior motive. There's some sort of agenda going on. Because the political types, as opposed to us anti political types, the political types always want their little deal with the state. They want their own little uh finagling, canoodling, pork barrel bullshit of some kind. It doesn't matter what it is, it's always something that they want out of the state as opposed to us where we want the state to be anathema. That's what the abolition of the state has always been about. If you go back to Lysander Spooner and others, because the state is basically the greatest threat to human liberty, at least in our lifetime and for some time to come. And that's why the second realm, the Agora, black markets, etc. That's why we're both exploring and developing these things because we're trying to get our meantime to harassment as long as possible. You know, we're trying, we're, uh, or as I have to go back to the original Vanu book, uh, we're, we're in protracted conflict with the state. I mean, full stop, like old man Rayo said, we are in protracted conflict with the state. And that's the way we're kind of approaching this as well. Uh, so all these guys where they're trying to like, like play games and do a little bit of reformism here and a little bit of reformism in there. And we'll take this one deal here, but we'll disagree with the state over there. It's like, no, there's no cherry picking here. You don't get to do cafeteria statism. It's kind of like cafeteria Christianity. You don't get to do cafeteria statism. Okay, these guys are up for blood. They're committed. They're focused. They are coming to kill you, and you need to act like it's that serious. Look at the political prisoner archive too, because those people got literally harassed and imprisoned and lost their freedom. So anyway, I didn't mean to give so much of a speech about that, but it, as you can see, what that minister said really kind of rattled with me a bit the longer I thought about it. So. I hope that was a use to at least some of you. No, I, so I'll have to, I'll have, I'll, I'm looking forward to re-listening to that in post-production. Um, um, yeah, second time through, I guess to fully, to fully, I guess, uh, get the gist of it. But um, I think I get you. I think I get you. And, and yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, yeah, I appreciate the analysis and the, uh, the explanation. Um, but yeah, it's been going for an hour and 24 minutes now, so I should probably begin to wrap up. Um yeah, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, good discussion. Uh, looking forward to. Uh, so I guess we've got the the two discussions on the table. The next one, uh, I guess I'm tentatively calling it a crypto war update. Um, Samurai <laughs> wall, political prisoners, and judicial transparency. Um, so that might be, you know, maybe the next one. 
and then uh, the following, uh, you know, some point we'll do the, I guess, the, the Great Paznia walkthrough. Um, since I haven't gone through all the details with you, and uh, um, and then again, I need to explain these things in a lot more detail to more people, um, especially now that the vision's getting clear. So um, it will be a, a very valuable thing um, at some point in the future. Um, and then, yeah, we got the, uh, I guess there's the security culture, or I guess the uh, the private security stuff that we, we've got some episodes to do on that too. So yeah, there's plenty plenty coming uh, when we get to it. Um, yeah, the the actual art, the actual episodes are getting fewer and far between. Um, and more so, I use uh, my my trusted uh, AI robot co-host uh, Brian. Um, does a lot of uh, he helps me out a lot. Um, my text to voice AI robot. Um, he's pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose we'll, we'll we'll get we'll get these out. Uh, yeah, we'll get to those. Hopefully, one uh, next week or two, and and uh, one the next week or two after that. But Kyle, anything else before I let you go, man? No, that'll be it. It just. You know, again, if people want to do maybe a variation on political field trips and maybe do like one religious field trip or maybe even do a variation on it, like go visit a synagogue, go visit a Catholic church or a Protestant church or whatever, and don't like necessarily worship, but maybe just listen. If they do sermons or a lecture or something equivalent, just really listen to what these guys are telling their people and then maybe write about it after the fact. I don't know. I, I think I might write an article about that, too, doing a religious field trip circuit kind of thing, because <laughs> if the different ministers, rabbis, priests, and others, if they're going to start getting political, which is fine. I don't have an issue with that necessarily. But if they are going to get political, then I think it would be remiss of us to just completely ignore it, because people in the first realm are definitely getting influenced by this kind of stuff, because some oh, of yeah. them, their only source of political uh, and political... Social, oh, excuse me, political socialization. Their only political socialization is through their churches, which, again, is not necessarily a bad thing. But if that is, because a lot of people are ignoring the corporate media, finally, thank God. But, <laughs> but a bump, you know, thank God they're ignoring corporate media, but then if their only source of political socialization is churches, then maybe that's something else we kind of maybe need to it's, explore. And it's maybe clo it's listeners... close enough to the same source, yeah, at this point. It's, it's close enough to the same source. With a different spin and a different flavor. And again, even if it comes from a good place, even if it comes from the purest of lily white snowflake intentions, if they're going to skew things in such a way where they're either going to push some sort of social justicing message or even if they try a different flavor and they want to do some sort of Christian nationalism, which was also, there was also a flag of that, right? The red, the red cross with the blue field on the white uh, flag or whatever. If they're going to do a Christian nationalist thing, I want to fucking know about it. Now, are they doing it? I don't know. I can only tell you about the one thing I went to, which I think was pretty harmless for the most part. But it does make me wonder about a lot of other churches that I haven't gone to. And I don't really want to dedicate the rest of my life to this, but I would suggest to the listeners if you want to do a variation of political field trips like I wrote about years ago, make it more religious field trips, do a circuit, follow a lot of the similar methods I wrote about in the political field trips article. If you want to do to just tailor it to churches and different types of churches and go for that variety, again, Jewish synagogue, Catholic, and I, even if you were to go to like a, even if it was like a, a Wiccan gathering or something, whatever their services are, I would suggest you do it and write about it. Seriously. And also like let us know too, because I, uh, you know, if they're not doing political messaging, cool. If they're keeping it strictly religious, I'm perfectly happy with that. That's First Amendment type stuff. That's 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 religious liberty. I'm happy. But if they're going to do political speech with that, I like to know what they're saying. Frankly, because that kind of affects what we're doing to some degree. Yeah, it definitely gives you, I guess, a more complete gauge on, uh, you know, where you know, so where the so-called, you know, quote unquote culture is nowadays, although it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's anyway. Um, yeah, I think that that's an interesting idea. Um, I hope, hope people follow up on that. Um, yeah, who knows the, yeah, who knows people will come across because I know when I was doing my uh, political field trips and even my, I guess you could say my, um, high level indoctrination field trips, there were some pretty spectacular things, or I guess spectacular, extraordinary, ex extraordinarily bad things said. Um, and promoted. So, um, yeah, you never know. You 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 never know how bad things will get. How things are until you actually go and check it out. So, uh, maybe maybe someone yeah, is uh, maybe someone's interested in doing that. And um, yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd uh, love to hear about it. Um, but yeah, Kyle, thanks for for yeah for all that, um, and for that new recommendation. Um, yeah, got me thinking on that now too. But um, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and go ahead and close Shane, out. Here. Are you going to go to church? 
No, Are you seriously not gonna me. go to church? I mean, yeah, I, I didn't think you would. Not me, no. no, this is this, this is something for the listeners to do if they want to take this one up. But I just thought it was funny that you might go to church because well, you I'll, might spontaneously want to be perfectly honest. <laughs> no, I'll step out into the Church of Self Liberation, which is our nature sanctuary. Um, that's really like <laughs> that's even better. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I like that. I like that. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and close it out. I don't want to keep you any longer, Kyle. Um, it was, as for the audience, uh, Pazni, I guess, uh, VaniPodcast.com is a place to go for all things Vanu, um, the complete archives, uh, free books, free audio books, all that. Uh, LibertyInterTech.com is, is a place to go for uh, you know books, uh, bundles, uh, audio books, uh, if you're looking for strategy guides, uh, Goros Anarchist Fiction, um, the Brushfire series by uh, Matthew Watecki, um, anything like that, libertyattack.com. And uh, we also do offer uh, uh, ghost pads and privacy tools. Uh, so um, ghost pads, ghost phones, and uh, much more is coming. Um, if you heard that last episode of the Jamin a um, couple couple weeks ago, I think it was. Um, yeah, we've got about seven or eight more. I mean, the, the ghost pad, or I guess the privacy, privacy tool section is going to probably double, um, which is great. I love to see it. Um, so keep, yeah, definitely, uh, keep a lookout for that. And, uh, then, yeah, lastly, Pazney.com, um, if you want to, to learn, learn about what we're building here at the Free Republic, uh, if you want to catch up with any, uh, you know, quote unquote departments, uh, you know, Pazney Monero department or Pazney Bitcoin department or, uh, Pazney department health and wellness, uh, whatever, all those links are there. You can learn exactly and specifically what we're looking into, uh, the second realm applications, um, those founded on voluntarism, truth, and, uh, peace versus the deception, coercion, and, this will say servility of the of the first realm. So, uh, anyway, uh, I guess I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks so much so much for tuning in. Uh, until next time, cheers. Vonia Life twenty twenty five resurrected. Introduction: Back in March nineteen seventy three. Rayo and many of the most hardcore self-liberators of the time, and likely even today, published a massive 75,000-word issue of Vonya Life, that is shockingly relevant and of immense value, even today. And while that was a highlight, there was also an entire zine series of Vonya Life, which I recently digitized. As Rayo finished up those last words of transcribing, it was with a heavy heart dot until the idea hit him like a collapsing roof of a badly engineered underground shelter. Vonya life should most certainly be resurrected, just as the overall freedom strategy of Vonya has in the modern day and age. And if you know anything about Vonya life, you know some of the greatest content came from contributors. That's where you come in. Let's dive into the plan. The plan. Vonya life. March 1973, was the only issue released in that year. Similarly, we should aim for one book a year, the first being Von U Life 2025. That will give ample time to acquire and create content, and to have plenty to report on as far as developments, or setbacks, of our liberated lifestyles. Content Section 1, Situations and Searches Lifestyle Reports from Self-Liberators, a report about your liberated lifestyle, things you've learned, your goals, what led you to venuism slash self-liberation, etc. Reviews of books, equipment, organizations, tips and tricks, etc. Information that you feel is valuable to pass on, that's not in article form. Section 2, General Strategy Back in Von Life's heyday, topics sought out included, Van Nomadism, Pedestrian Nomadism, Wilderness Von U, international travel, family and children, intentional communities, new country projects, financial independence, health liberation, vonu in cities, and underground shelters and troglodytism, we still want articles on any and all of those topics, but additional ones include, private communications, sovereign networking, vonuing in cities in the 2020s, alternative housing solutions, etc. If you're curious about your topic in particular, just ask. Examples of both will be posted at vonupodcast.com slash the year 2025. Timeframes Any submissions must be made by July 1, 2025. After a few months of editing and preparing, we will aim for a fall 2025 release. Notes This is not a general, send us an article submission to fill space. It has to be of the caliber that Vonulife deserves and was founded upon, Hardcore solutions slash hardcore action, 
no political crusading and no collective movementism, the principle of voluntarism, that all interactions should be voluntary, must be maintained. I.e., don't siphon, steal, gas to fund your van nomadism. General proofreading slash editing will be done on every article, maintaining each author's individual voice, but as always, editorial designs have to be made. Email submissions, questions, ideas to, shane at libertyunderattack.com.